All right, now joining us on Tennis Channel Inside In, a New York Times writer for over 25 years now. Uh, last year, he wrote uh, another one of his classic tennis books, The Master, The Long Run, and The Beautiful Game of Roger Federer. It's out on paperback this week. Uh, became a New York Times bestseller and international success. Now joining the show, respected journalist in the tennis game, Chris Cleary. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Mitch. Good to be with you. Well, it's been a year since the book came out. I do want to start there. Um, there's still a lot more of your tennis you know, writing journey along, but this is definitely a high mark. I think everybody that I've talked to in and outside of the industry uh, have revered it right from the get-go. Uh, what was the feedback like for you? I'm assuming it was all pretty positive, but what was it like? What types of feedback did you get from your peers, from people following the sport, from players in the sport? What type of feedback did you get about this highly detailed profile of the great Roger Federer? Hey, you know, it's been interesting. I mean, it's, it's been pretty global in terms of the, the reach of it because of the way it got translated. And because Roger, obviously, like pro tennis, it's a global game. He's a global figure. So there was probably more interest, you know, in um, outside in Europe and Australia and other places, even South Africa, than there was maybe in North America for, for Federer and, and his biography. But I feel like very blessed. On the whole, it's been positive. Of course, it hasn't been 100% positive. I'm not sure that would be possible or even trustworthy <laughs> if that were the uh, case. Yeah. I think you have to expect you're going to get some some blows to the body um, when you do anything creative like this, especially about somebody that's prominent about Roger, who's like Roger, who's been written about a lot. And um, But I have to say, for me, it was it, the most fulfilling experience of my career. I've been doing this for 35 years, been writing for the time as and the International Herald Tribune before that, you know, part of the same company for about 30 years. So it's really been gratifying. I think it's because you put so much into it and it's a really detailed thing. And, you know, newspaper journalism is, is wonderful, but it's pretty ephemeral. You're putting it out there day to day, hour to hour. It tends to evaporate more quickly, fair or not fair. That's the way it works. But the books seem to have more life. And this one really has. And I feel like it's what people took the most out of it was, I think, the process being able to get inside this process uh, through all the people who spoke with me and Roger over the years. And I think to get a, a better sense of the rivalries and, you know, it doesn't explore Roger's off court life in, in enormous detail. Uh, I wasn't privy to that, but it does talk a lot of, through his voice and, and others about people who mattered the most to him and made the biggest impact. And I think that's where the book uh, stands out if it does. Well, I think it certainly stands out. And I think, you know, like, anything we would want more of it and you could if you wrote the whole Federer story it would be like 5,000 pages like at least like that's where I mean obviously you have to fit it in the confines of the book which I thought you did uh wonderfully uh and I also think and maybe you know you can kind of talk to this too a lot of people get book ideas and then all right now it's time to start doing the research yours was unique because you had built up equity built up a relationship with Roger for several decades covering him at his first Grand Slam match and then going all the way through built up a relationship there was still obviously a lot of work to it but I do think it was a little different than how most books are created you had that foundation in place and ultimately decided to run with it yeah I think what really made it interesting for me was you may be right I mean I think that it is unusual to probably have that many years and then and then do it but I think the temptation when you have that situation is okay I've got it all already um, I've got all these interviews in the book 20 plus with Roger over the years, talked to pretty much everybody who was close to him at different times during that period. And you kind of go, well, okay, let's just do the book. But I didn't want to do that. I think the reason why was I wanted to have the energy creatively to do it uh, anew and to learn things as I went through the process, not just kind of regurgitate. So I really committed to doing a lot of original research just for the book. And I talked to over 80 people, people I had never had a chance to actually, you know, like Christian Marcoli, who was his uh, sports psychologist in his youth. And uh, people like uh, the Maleva sisters who, who knew, um, you know, Pierre Paganini, Rogers, guru of a fitness trainer from a very early age and worked with him as well. I mean, it was a really in the round kind of thing. And I had really never talked to Peter Lundgren at, at great length before, one of Rogers' early coaches. So it was, a, it was a really learning curve for me. And honestly, that's what I enjoyed the most. The writing part was hard, <laughs> but yeah. the, uh, the research was a blast. And I, you know, I love talking to Roddick about his experience. He was fantastic. Murat Safin was also just terrific rolling a cigarette in Moscow on a, on a Zoom call during the pandemic, talking for a couple hours, yeah. as only Seth and Ken about his experiences with Roger when they were young, going to disco techs and things like that. And, and then the match in Australia, which is one of the best. So I think that's what helped it. I think lift was that it had the background, 20 years of research done incrementally. And then it had, you know, 
five, six months of really intense research done more or less in a panic, but it was a fun panic. Well, do you think that that's like the crowning achievement of, of your instincts that you were there in 1999 and thought that this kid had something special? I mean, you still, I, I would, if I made that call that you did, I would be, you know, feeling on top of the world that in 19. Yeah. You know, well, I wasn't alone. That's for sure. I was not alone. I got somebody sent me out there in the first place. It wasn't me just following my antenna out there. A couple of agents who didn't represent Rogers said, you should go out and watch this guy. He's special. And we know because we tried to sign him and we didn't get him or something like yeah. that. So, so I was, I definitely wanted to sit out there in the stands and that was, you know, Mitch, that was pre social media, pre YouTube, pre all these things. So you really didn't have a lot of footage of people in the early stages of their developmental uh, process. Now you get you know, you, for people like uh, Yannick Sinner or Coco Goff play their first matches. You've seen a yeah. lot of them already. Think about the Fruvertova sisters now are coming up, um, the sisters from Czech Republic. Right. There's a lot of a lot of footage, but Roger, there really wasn't much. So you're kind of getting your first look at these guys on the court as a journalist. That's very impactful. Um, so yeah, but I do feel like I got a sense he was special early on, confirmed in 2001 when he just trumped us in Davis Cup in Basel from the U.S. And I was always interested after that. And, and he's a very engaging guy. And it's amazing to watch the way he's kept it fresh for so many years. It's funny. I was talking with Mark Petchy on this show about the the increase in coverage, like what you just said with social media footage is out there, but also our expectations. And we just want it more now. We want these players to be great right away. Yeah, yeah. Rogers, and you talk about it in the book that there was some backlash to not, him not having success early in his tennis career some of the grand slam, slam losses in 2002, early 2003 in particular. If that happens to one of these kids coming up, and I use kids loosely, but one of these players now, we're all up in arms. Like why aren't Coco Goff, Carlos Alcaraz, why aren't they doing more every single tournament? I think in a way it was kind of good for Roger not to have this social media age where we had all this footage and we're expecting him to win so early. Yeah, I think it makes these players who are very young still feel like they've been around forever social media and the footage you know you feel like coco has been a part of our labs already for as tennis people for four or five years now or maybe even longer um yeah. and that's crazy when she's only 18 years old uh, in roger's case maybe we can use that example as journalists to uh do a better job i mean to see that someone like roger would you know didn't win a grand slam in his teens no matter how great he was and how prodigious the talent he was that's instructive it helps you realize you've got to be able to uh you know take a deep breath put it in a timeline and, and do your best to be able to uh, not you know, overemphasize the defeats and not go crazy at the victories. I've been trying to apply that as a journalist to covering Carlos Alcaraz, to be honest, mm -hmm. trying to do my best not to get too carried away. And you can see the talent, you can see what he could do, but yeah. potential is, is only part of the game. It certainly is. Uh, and just a couple more things on Federer and uh, this book. Um, and we talk about how he's often compared and always will be compared to Novak Djokovic, Rafael Nadal, his rivals, and they're ahead of, him, ahead of him in the Grand Slam count now. Looks like it's probably for good. But one of the things that you touch on and you really peel back the layers on is Federer's image, his likability, how great of a sportsman he was. I don't see anybody in sports, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that, and for lack of a better phrase, Chris, is better at being famous than Roger Federer. He just had that magical full total package to handle the role and the weight that he had. And then I don't think that tennis will be seeing an ambassador like him for a very long time, if ever. That's a great way of putting it. I mean, he is very good at being famous <laughs> and I think he really enjoys it. Yeah. And a lot of guys find that a big burden. I think that's part of the, the key to Roger in so many ways is he's found a way to manage his own mentality, his own schedule, his own life to be able to keep it light. So I think he has this great, internal barometer about when things get too stressful or when he starts to feel himself losing the, uh, the joy in the moment. And that's when he takes his breaks. That's when he uh, shuts things down. He knows when to do it. I think that's one of his gifts. And it's maybe not as obvious as the, uh, you know, the uh, swooping forehand or the effortless volleys and all that, but that, which is just as important for his career. So I, I, th I think that's just to see him, I think Roddick says this too in the book, he says, just to watch the ease with which Roger handles the duties that come along with his job and his success is, in my view, unprecedented. He's a, he's a guy who's not been able to really uh, let these normal pressures and burdens weigh him down too much. And I think that's, uh, that's to his credit. And honestly, we can't learn a lot from watching him play tennis, to be honest. It's, <laughs> it's hard to relate to that. Yeah. But we can learn a lot from his process. And I know it, I've actually thought about it a lot in the last year since I wrote the book about 
ways to keep my own self at this stage of my journalism career fresh. And I think it applies to a lot of things. It's remarkable how he is one of the few that enjoys winning more than he hates losing. It's like that old cliche that these top players are just supposed to hate losing more than they love winning. He's the opposite. And uh, I did, I mean, my favorite part of the book might've actually been hearing that he was a throwback. He's a historian. Like he appreciates records. He appreciates the past of the game. I hope that the next generation kind of aims to be that, but what remains to be seen. But did you get the sense that he was kind of a, an old school throwback in that regard, just how much he appreciates the lineage of tennis? He definitely does now. I'd say in the last 10, you know, maybe 10 to 15 years, I think that's come on strong. I don't know early on in his teens that he was that way. I mean, Roger wasn't much of a student by his own admission. He was not huh. a, an academic guy. He kind of went dragging his sneakers to class, um, had probably some traumatic memories from his time speaking very little French and being thrust into French, uh, you know, junior high school uh, back in, in Switzerland. That's tough or early high school, I should say. So I think it took him a while to maybe, he's such a hyperactive character in his youth. He's somebody who's so wound up and keyed up. He has coaches talk about him being hard to talk to early on because he'd be sitting in front of you and so much energy flowing. It was almost like he couldn't sit still. You almost were better off talking to him on the run or talking to him while he was moving. But I do think over time, guys, like his, you know, sadly, the late Peter Carter, who was his early coach, he was an Australian and was coached by some great people in Adelaide growing up uh, and tied into that Aussie tradition. Tony Roach, another Aussie who coached him, obviously huge connection to the history of the game. Peter Lundgren was very tight with Bjorn Borg, um, tapped into Born, Bjorn Borg very early for Roger as a resource. And uh, they called him, you know, out of the blue a couple of times and Peter Lundgren could do this incredible Bjorn Borg imitation. So he didn't even need to call Bjorn, he could just have Peter do it yeah. for him. So all these guys that he had early in his, in his sphere had a lot of connections to the history of tennis and to the main figures in the history of tennis. And Roger got a you know, firsthand glimpse of that early on, and I'm sure that played a role. And also, people automatically were putting him in the pantheon very early just because the way he played. And I think he was getting a lot of comparison questions and you know, greatest of all time questions pretty early on. So that definitely piques your interest in history when they're talking about you, too, in that continuum. So I think those all played a role. Yeah, the last thing I wanted to ask you going into what we thought was going to be the final act of Roger Federer for as long ago as hard to believe 14 years. This really does feel like it is now with all the knee surgeries. He's into his 40s now. What's reasonable to expect when we see Roger in terms of how much he plays, the level, and uh, how his goodbye, whenever his official goodbye of the game is, how he's going to be able to process that when he has to step away from the sport of tennis. Yeah. You know, Mitch, things may have changed. My sense from Wimbledon, talking to people there, was that Roger is not trying to just to come back for the Labor Cup and Basel. He wants to come back, get himself back up and running again, and then try to play, you know, a more significant schedule in 2023. Mm -hmm. Many things, as we know, can change. I think it all comes down to movement, frankly. Yeah. I think if he's able to move well, um, flow without pain, and, and he's obviously lost a half a step or a step from his prime, it's impossible he couldn't have it. 41 years old, but if he's able to move well, um, the racket skills don't go away. I don't think, um, the technique is too pure motivations there probably for the right reasons. He wants to come back for love of the game connection with the people and, and play some more because he didn't like the way it ended last time, or he just wants the process. So I think it's reasonable to expect that he could be competitive match to match. Do I see him winning seven best of five matches in a row, winning another slam? Definitely not. I don't just the too many players in the way. And, too much talent getting better every day. It's young when you're not getting better every day at 41. So, but can you come out in a Wimbledon match or a Masters 1000 match against a great player and, and beat him over best of three sets or challenge him, push him hard? If he can move, then he can, no doubt. No doubt. More with Chris Clary here on Tennis Channel Inside In uh, as we transition on from Roger Federer, both in the show and I guess in the game of tennis. You mentioned in the book, there was a conversation in his training towards uh, one of his comebacks, recent comebacks, where you were talking about players that could maybe assume the mantle and make that move. Asking you now as the journalist, as someone covering the sport who's been around for several of these transitions of power, seeing the one generation go down and the next generation come up and players emerge, are there certain players, maybe the obvious ones or maybe some of the not so obvious ones that you've got your eye on? that you think could be the ones to ascend to the very tip top of the game? 
Well, we talked a lot about these things, these things in our in our world here. It's, it's like we're always speculating, especially we have been for almost 10 years about who's going to take over when the big three or used to be the big four, big five are gone. Yeah. It's taking a lot longer than we thought. I mean, I personally just the sensations that Carlos Alcaraz creates when you watch him, the shot making ability, the movement, um, the zeal and love of what he's doing out there and the results he's had uh, consistent, but he's shown some incredible big match capabilities, I think, already in an early stage. I got to like his upside. You just have to. I mean, and, and I, I wish that for the game because he's spectacular and people who don't really follow tennis come back from an Alcaraz match and they're they're excited. Yeah. Yannick Center, wonderful ball striker, obviously making some good decisions, hiring Darren Cahill as part of your team is a smart move at that stage, a formative stage. Um, I've been very impressed with Yannick's sort of uh, presence on the court, very different character than, than an Alcaraz much more self-contained, much more uh, maybe a aficionados type of tennis player where you got to really appreciate the ball striking and preparation to fully understand how good he is. Got to watch him live too. You know, I, from an American perspective, I really like uh, what Fritz is doing, but he's not young anymore by young standards. But I think Fritz has shown steady progress, clearly has great appetite for work and progress. He's got some big weapons. I don't think he's going to be a multiple, multiple, many, many Grand Slam winner, but he could pick off a couple. I think if everything goes well and he continues to improve. But the big one for me is you know, Sebi Corda. It looks like he's got a lot of the tools you need to succeed in the modern game. Um, don't know if he's as fast maybe as some of the guys he'll be playing against, but he's got great uh, all around power and uh, timing and a great eye for the game. Seems to love coming forward to net. I think that net component is going to be very, very big for the next generation. So those three guys. In, yeah. I'm not going to start speculating about a guy like Ben Shelton who just, you know, just turned pro from, from uh, Florida and had some big results uh, in Cincinnati, but yeah. you see an athlete like that with that kind of personality and character and a charismatic game, you hope he goes far and goes long, but that's, that's way too early to put Ben yeah. in that category. Well, the big three, big four, uh, I guess just the big three in this case did a lot of great things for tennis. One of the things that I think kind of that they, laughably a little bit ruined was realistic grand slam expectations because mm. they just won all of them just thinking like with Alcaraz obviously he's everybody's can't miss prospect if he wins seven majors that's like John McEnroe level and it's a third of what these guys are doing so I think we are going to be in an era where those names you said I think are going to be near the top contending and ultimately most likely winning multiple majors but I think we're going to be you know taking a step back to the previous eras where we have guys that win, you know, five, six, maybe a couple of guys get two or three. I think there'll be, wouldn't say parody that you'd have to go to the other tour, maybe, <laughs> maybe to find some of that. But I do mm. think though, there's going to be more grand slam winners, but to get to double digits, even, I think that might be a tall task for any of these guys. The thing is I've kind of learned Mitch over the years. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. And, yeah. and in a sense, the men's game, it's almost been the staircase effect. Yeah. Because you, had, you had the guys like, you know, Mac and Connors and Borg, and then you had, Becker and Edberg came along and then Pete who really put the grand slam title race on the map. He really, he really cared about it. And he put it out yeah. there. You could see it was attainable for him. And it wasn't in my memory, it wasn't as big a deal at all until Pete came along and Pete was the one who popularized it. Right. And Pete put it there. Andre was well behind him in the count, but Andre was a huge figure culturally. And, mm -hmm. and also with the four winning all four majors was also important. And then, so there the, the staircase goes here. And then these last guys, that are still still there, except <laughs> yeah. for Roger right now. They put it up at an even higher level. So yeah. I, part of me goes, okay, are we at the top of the staircase? It sure looks that way, but I just I can't rule out exceptional right. talent. I've seen it too often. You've seen yeah. people come along and just take over things, and you just you think the sport's already reached its ultimate iteration, and it hasn't. So That's a good point. I, I'd like to say I'm not sure Carlos is that guy, Alcaraz or Sinner's that guy, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is a guy who comes along and is able to dominate all his peers. So you have to succeed young to build up a 20, 20 plus count in Grand Slam titles. Then you got to have the staying power. But now these guys that have played for the last 20 years have shown you how to do it. They've mm -hmm. shown you it's possible. And these guys who are starting out, they know what they have to do early on. Whereas some of these other guys had to discover it as they went along. Now it's clear. You want to last 20, 25 years in pro tennis? This is how you do it. Yeah. And so that's going to be an advantage for the, if you have an exceptional talent who comes along with all that data. Now why not? Build another level in the house and then just keep yeah, yeah, yeah. let's keep going. going. Now, I, I, every time I've sort of tried to put a limit on things, I've been surprised. So I, I'm hesitant to do that now. Yeah, well, absolutely. And and I do want to just mention too, because the women's game, Serena Williams is going to be most likely, certainly 
playing her last major here at the last tournament here at the U S open. And I thought about this in comparison to the, the Federer conversation. Obviously she's the greatest in her sport and the comparisons are there, but watching her and unfortunately struggle the last couple of times, I kept coming back to the sense that this is such a graceful, beautiful game. But it's also maybe the hardest, Chris, to age in. It's very tough to keep competing one-on-one -on -one in a sport that demands so much of you, that relies, as you said, with Federer on movement. If you slip at all, this sport can and, and unfortunately will eat you alive in a lot of ways. So I think that's part of, unfortunately, the downside of all these athletes when they don't walk away early is that if they keep it going as long as possible, it's just such a hard, brutal sport to age in. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, if you're a team sport, you can sub out play a you know less important role but still be a factor i mean it's not unlike boxing or sports when you're really in yeah, direct, that'd be the worst <laughs> when you're in direct confrontation with yeah. somebody yeah. in the sense that when there's a gap uh on a tennis court in the boxing ring wherever it is it's it can become a pretty uh difficult gap to ignore and i think that's what happened with serena against raducanu and um, at the western and southern serena wasn't 100 physically i think her knee was bothering her that 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 week Hopefully, I think she played a bit better against Benchic when she played her uh, uh, in, in Canada before that. But you're right. I think it's, it's part of the, the cruel beauty of tennis is that oh. there's no place to hide, no subs coming. And uh, if things are going badly, they can get worse. <laughs> you, can, yeah. you, can, you can lose even more points. Yeah. So I, it is part of the reason why I think it has been hard to, uh, to last a long time in this sport because, let's face it, these are great champions who are used to winning. And when that suddenly becomes uh, no longer the norm, that's very hard to accept. And so even though I, I've changed my tune, I don't know how you feel about it, but I, I don't feel like we should force these great athletes to stop when they're no longer at their peak. They have a craft, just like you and I have a craft. It's something they've honed over many, many years. They're probably never going to do anything better than that in their lives. So if they want to keep, you know, building wooden furniture, let them do it, you know, but I, but it is hard to watch sometimes. Right. I, I, I agree with that. I guess maybe my pushback a little bit, and I would ask you what you think as well as just a follow-up. The idea that if, if it gets to a point where it's pretty low, would you ever cup or cap the wild card situation at any point? Or would they just be allowed to get into as many tournaments? I guess maybe Venus is a better example of this. Like, would you continually give wild cards for as long as they want if they are Hall of Fame talent that have done this? Or would you say, okay, now it's now it's time that you don't get a wild card? Oh, I think there, there definitely is a, a shelf life on that. Yeah. The Williams sister's shelf life is pretty long. Yeah, they've earned the right to, and it's just a matter can, of you no know, yeah. can can tuna. It's going quite a while there. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> but I, but there's no yeah. doubt there's there's a shelf life. Yeah, people aren't like going to want to see aging tennis stars forever uh, in tournaments. Yeah. And ultimately, yeah. it's not entirely fair to see somebody take a spot of a young, talented player if they they can't compete at all. Yeah, it's like the Masters, you know, eventually the former champion, they just kind of tell them, hey, you might not want to play anymore. Uh, mm. No, I. Uh, I do want to ask about two of his uh, two of Rod, Rogers, two main rivals going into this U.S. Open. Uh, no, no, Novak Djokovic again uh, at a major for the second time this year. Uh, officially official today uh, was not allowed into the country. And uh, we don't have to get into the specifics of all that. It's all out there. But Chris, just from the historical side, the magnitude of Novak's decision to, to not get vaccinated, the fact that he's leaving two grand slams on the table, obviously no guarantee that he would win, but this feels like something that is going to be because the record book chase felt the shockwaves of this are going to be felt for a long time. And it's kind of startling to see that somebody right or wrong, whatever anyone's opinion is, has decided to not play in two of the four grand slams in his mid thirties chasing history. No, it's just extraordinary. And I, it's something that's just, I never would have seen coming a couple of years ago. Clearly not, especially as motivated and healthy and, and um, systematic Novak's been about his career and how he's built for longevity and the way he structures everything. So this is just an extraordinary twist in this whole uh, big three era and this saga of tennis, but it goes beyond that. It's, it's obviously, a, I think people, when they mention the history of this period in, in general, they, Novak Djokovic could be a paragraph in there and some history book as well. I think it reflects the era and the, uh, the different uh, conflicts that got created, the, the hard choices that had to get made. And, and I think, especially the situation in Australia, yeah. where he's there and he ends up getting deported. It creates this national, international incident. It's a pretty good encapsulation of both sides of the argument um, right there in that situation. I lived it. It was, it was tough to see because you could see Novak. I personally think he came down there th thinking he was okay. And I think he was given some bad advice. Maybe he made the wrong choice to, uh, 
to risk it at all, but I think it was a tough thing to see in the sense I think it was, uh, it was really beyond his control in that part of it. But he has made a conscious choice. It's a choice not to do what almost everybody else in his sport has done. If you believe that they all got vaccinated and all their certificates are valid and that um, they've all got their second shots or boosters, I don't know, but everybody else in his sport who competes, all his rivals have done this and he has not. So it is a choice. And you're right, the impact of this, despite uh, Novak's longevity and his ability to be elastic, even in his mid thirties, it could be the decisive factor, it really could. Uh, and I, it's, it's a weird, not wondrous, but weird way for it to happen. Yeah. And I have something I can say too, I feel like with Novak, you have to respect that he's stuck by his principles, whether you agree with them or not. I personally don't agree with his choice, but it's not up to me to say that, it's his choice. And as this thing has evolved, you can see that, you know, it's nowhere near as cut and dried as it looked a mm -hmm. year ago. Yeah. So, but it is extraordinary, no doubt. Certainly shades of gray in all aspects of life. And he has stuck to his guns at the, at the sacrifice of winning more majors. So he's not in the U S open. Rafael Nadal is played one match after the injury uh, in Cincinnati lost to eventual chap Bor Borna Chorich. He goes into this major. Chris, it's, it's kind of remarkable. He's going for, has a good chance to be number one. He spent 17 straight years in the top 10. He's going for his third Grand Slam title in the same year. That's only happened once in 2010. So on the look of it, I mean, on the surface, this could go down if he were to win the U.S. Open. This could go down as one of the best Rafael Nadal years ever at age 36. Yeah, no, you're right. Absolutely. And, you know, you think about how well he was playing in Indian Wells before he ended up with that, that freaky thing with his, with his rib. So it's been, it's been a lot of uh, just fabulous, timely clutch tennis from Rafa this season. And it reminds me a lot of, of, of Roger's season, to be honest, in 2017, you know, when he came back after that break of six months and yeah. had wings again and had made some shifts in his tactical strategy on the backhand and had new belief and, and he was just ready to go. And Nadal, the first few months of the season was very much like that for me. And then the French Open was one of his great achievements. I know he talks himself down. He always does. And we always fall for it. I have many times. I don't think he's doing it in, you know, in some malicious way. I think it's just the yeah. way his mind works. But you know, extraordinary to get through that the way he did and win and beat Djokovic the way he beat him in the quarters. Why do you think we, and I throw myself in there, admittedly, why were we all wrong about the longevity questions? Because we all had them early. Like, he plays so physical. This is a great peak. But he's not going to hold up. Why were we all just dead wrong about Rafael Nadal lasting this long? Yeah, I was dead wrong, too, definitely. I was working off the... Andre Agassi template being barely able to walk in his mid thirties and yeah. saying that Rafa was cashing checks that his body or writing checks that his body couldn't cash. So I, I, I was steeped in that and it seemed like it made sense. A lot of those great stars were stopping, um, beaten down really in their early, very early thirties. So I think what happened was I think recovery and, and medical things have improved. I think people are, have got you know, better means at their disposal, but I think above all, it's just, Nadal's hard beating competitive heart. I think he just special with yeah. his willingness to put up with pain that others would say no mas. And he says mas is extraordinary. And I think he just loves that competitive process. I've always felt that way about him was that he's more engaged and he's more excited about winning the point than he is winning the title. Wow. He wants to win that rally. You know, I think he really does. That's what it's about. It's not really about, I get to hold it up and hold it over you and I beat you. It's more like, ah. I'm with myself in this and you watch him practice. It's the same way. I mean, he almost looks more disappointed after he misses a practice shot than he does in a match. So I think that's what it is. That's, that's the driving force. And, you know, Rafa, as you can see from his rituals on court is a guy of routine. He's a guy who, who needs that, takes strength from that. And tennis is a sport where you can really live off those routines. So I think it's all those factors, but he's the most, I would say, extraordinary competitor, maybe up there with, with Jordan that I've ever seen in my long career in sports. Agree completely. And I would also add that at the Australian Open, you could see it like other athletes like Jordan, like full contact American football players, hockey players. He has that look where, you know, he's suffering, but he's willing to suffer to get to the mountaintop. Like he will fight through pain. He shows toughness in a sport where there is toughness, but not to the level that he possesses. And, you know, these, I agree with you, modern medicines improved, training methods have improved, but he, along with Federer and Djokovic, they're just special. They're like different breeds. I know that phrase gets thrown around a lot, but they are special. Also, because they knew from all that early interaction 
Yeah. And they didn't exactly come up after chumps either. They had guys like Sampras and Agassi that were there before them. So they could see what was where the bar had been before. So, but they, they had to feed off each other, a bunch of electrons all yeah. in the same space, trying to find a, a way forward. And it's been, it's been great to watch. And that's why I wrote the book, to be honest, because I felt like I, I wanted to capture before I forgot everything. <laughs> I wanted to capture what I'd seen because I felt in my career, I've seen a lot of stuff, but that was, this has been the most extraordinary era extended era that I've seen these rivalries or something else. A couple more things before we wrap up here with Christopher Clary, a New York times writer, writer of the uh, master of the long run and beautiful game of Roger Federer U S open 2022, the final grand slam of the year. We mentioned Nadal's participation in it. Serena Williams is retirement coming up Two big storylines. What other subplots are you looking at as this tournament uh, gets about going we got qualifying now but what other uh, storylines are you looking forward to that's a great question i gotta tell you i'm a little bit uh, blinded by this the serena williams beat we're all on right now i mean i feel like i said i came back from uh, my quick break after after wimbledon and the british open golf and it's just been the serena channel um, that's what it feels like for me so but you know in terms of the i the women's game is fascinating i've really enjoyed covering it all along all these but especially of late i think just with all this movement and he thought Sviantec was going to take it over with 37 matches in a row and hard court and clay court dominance. And then suddenly there's some doubt about that. So I think the storyline for me is to watch Iga closely. If Iga can recapture that form she had earlier in the year, that belief in her shots, the risk taking and managing it. And she was just dominating people. Can she get that back? I would guess not. I think if she wins, it's going to be much tighter than it was in the spring, but yeah. it'd be interesting to see with her talent. And clearly she's won on hard courts before and done really, really well. Why can't she do it here? So that next step for her at a non-clay major, I think is very important. So that's for sure a big, a big one I'm watching. That's a good, good one. I think her clay dominance kind of just lifted expectations on all service, all surfaces, maybe a little bit too high, but she can still be very great on, on every surface, especially hard courts. So to see what she does, uh, the defending champs, which we haven't even mentioned, Emma Raducanu goes into this tournament having to defend a lot of points. Pretty brutal first round draw, Elze, Elze Cornet right off the get go. And if she falls, the, the rankings are going to plummet there. Uh, she's somebody I'm looking forward to, Coco Goff, who we alluded to the trajectory. Maybe not as fast as some people might be a little too greedy have liked, but she's gotten herself top 10, pushing forward, looking for a great run there as well. I think the women's game has, it's almost like Chris, I, Chris, I keep going to let's get to the second week and then I'll give you a prediction. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's very much like that. It's true. And, I, and then this year, maybe it's for different reasons. Let's get to the second week because the first week is going to be about Serena or at least the first days. And yeah. maybe Venus. Let's see what Venus does. I yeah. don't know what Venus is up to, but I'm very curious. Uh, Daniil Medvedev going to defend his major title from a year ago where he ended Djokovic's quest in the final match to win all four Grand Slams. Hasn't had the reps. Russian players haven't been able to play at every single tournament. The Wimbledon tournament's the big one that stands out, but Medvedev's form, kind of a mystery. Lost to Kyrgios, who's been on fire uh, when they played. But what do you think about Daniil Medvedev's chances to go into this tournament, defend his crown, or at least get deep into it? You know, they're not as good as they would have been last year, just based on his body of work so far this season. And you've also got to remember, he missed a fair bit of the clay court season with the hernia operation he had as well. So you're right on the reps. Um, I'm sure the situation with the war and, and Medvedev's, uh, you know, being forced to face it and penalized by it and, and navigated in press conferences and his private life and everything. I'm sure it takes a huge toll more than any of us know. Um, so I feel like that's certainly been a factor in this season, but we've all seen him on hard courts when he's right. Yeah. And he had Nadal on the ropes in Australia in the final as well. He looked like he was ready to become the hard court guy and sort of take over the game, at least on that surface. Now has been regression. So, yeah. you know, you know, he's got to be inside desperate to recapture that. He knows he has the tools, but other guys are rising too. So yeah. I love to see an, an Alcaraz Medvedev match where Alcaraz is trying to destroy and and Medvedev's trying to defend. That would be a wonderful matchup, I think. That would be the, that would be the final. Um, don't want to get a, too far ahead though, because we could get Medvedev and Kyrgios pretty early in this tournament. Uh, a second round match that I want to see just selfishly as an American would be Tommy Paul and uh, Sebastian Corda. Yeah, I saw that. That's, yeah. I'm 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 down on one side because they would play so early, but I feel I really do feel like honestly that the winner of that match is primed for a big run. Uh, and then of course, if we get Nadal Alcaraz in the semis, that could just be <laughs> something yeah, totally. You're right. You're right. Totally I, I, that captures the city. 
I like that there's, I mean, I think it's, it's a big hit to the sport not to have Novak in the U.S. Open. I mean, he was just won Wimbledon. Yeah. He, he almost completed the Grand Slam at the U.S. Open last year. This is, you know, a self-inflicted situation in some ways, but it's, just, it's too bad for the sport because, I mean, it takes that great component out of there. And I don't say it diminishes the U.S. Open to a great degree, but it does diminish the U.S. Open to some degree. Well, Chris Clary, you've been uh, very generous with your time. Uh, last, last thing. What's next for you? Another tennis book or uh, another deep profile of one of the game's greats? Or can we expect another book? I know we're all just clamoring for it. You know, I definitely want to write another one. This has been a, a very positive process for me, but I also took a lot out of me. And yeah. you know, my main job is covering tennis for the times. And I've been doing that a long time and I still get a lot of pleasure out of that. So that's the focus for now. But I, you know, before I'm done, I will definitely be writing some more books or at least one more before I realize uh, my limitations <laughs> at yeah. this point. But it, it's been a real, a real treat. And I really appreciate if anybody listening to your podcast, read the book or is interested in it. I really appreciate the support. It's meant a lot to me. I'm at a stage in my career where I'm not a young guy. I'm, I'm kind of been closer to the end than the beginning. It's been really gratifying to get the kind of uh, feedback and response that, that I've gotten for this book. Well, that was Chris Cleary, author of the master, the long run and beautiful game of Roger Federer out on hardcover and now paperback. Uh, you can catch him at the New York Times uh, covering the U.S. Open. Also wrote a good piece there on Ben Shelton's decision to go pro. Chris, thanks for joining Tennis Channel Insight and hope to catch up again soon. Mitch, it was a great pleasure. Thanks so much.